Good morning, City Life. Thank you for being here in our service this morning. Uh, for those of you watching online, whatever time you're watching, we want to welcome you as well. So I hope you've been enjoying this prayer series that we've been doing called Desperation. And right now we're actually going to take a two-week break because it's February and, you know, everybody talks about relationships in February. So we're going to take a two-week break. We are going to cover uh, today and next Sunday the kind of hot topics of marriage and and really we're going to kind of look at what the basis of a godly biblical relationship looks like we are going to be talking about marriage specifically but if you're dating single engaged or married uh, this is all for you because statistically here in the u.s um, you are going to get married that's just the statistic okay so the majority of you will anyways um, so if you're sitting there like, ooh, there is hope for me. Yes, there is. Okay. So here's what I want to share with you today. This is really exciting. We had some real creativity from our team who came up with a brilliant idea. We are going to talk to you of five different months consecutively about a topic each month. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a break during our regular series for one week and we're going to talk about this topic so what these topics are going to be um we're going to talk about communication we're going to talk about sex we're going to talk about parenting parenting sorry and we're going to talk about unresolved conflict in the marriage today we're talking about what it means to have a godly marriage what that looks like and so what we're going to do here's the fun creative part we would normally do a valentine's day big dinner where we get everybody together, maybe have a speaker. It's a lot of fun. We will do them again in the future. But for this year, coming out of COVID and still unsure, what we're going to do is we are encouraging you as couples to go out and have date nights on your own. So here's what it will look like. For an example, today, next Sunday, you're going to hear teaching about communication. So for the week of February 21st through the 27th, we are going to ask you to go out on a date, whether you're dating, engaged, or married. We're going to ask you to go out on a date. What we're going to do is we're going to shoot a three to five minute video covering the topic that we want you guys to talk about. We're then going to give you some discussion questions and maybe just kind of a fun wrap up for the night. And we're going to do this through February, March, April, May, and June. Okay. Now, depending on how it goes, maybe we'll just continue it year round. Uh, but we think this is going to be really fun and a really great way for us to just engage deeper in relationships. So hopefully you guys are excited about this because a couple things can happen. You know, 2020 threw all of us for a loop. And one of the hardest hit places that we have seen across this country has been relationships, especially the marriage relationship. Because that is where you saw the cracks and crevices start to be exposed, especially when a couple is inside the house with each other and didn't have that escape, if you will, to go out and, and operate in the normalcy of where they were operating before. And quarantine, quarantine did some damage there. We want to help you re-engage with just kind of a thriving relationship. So these do not have to be extravagant dates. They don't need to be expensive dates. If you do that, that's great. But the most important thing is that you're together and you're communicating, that you're talking, that you're having fun, uh, that you're discussing these things in real gracious honesty, okay? So our goal would be that all the couples would participate in this and that maybe we'll highlight some stories on what you guys did, how creative you are on the dates that you took. Maybe you need to, you know, send the kids out of the house and do it in, in the home, whatever it is for you. We just want you to be very intentional getting alone, preferably out of your house uh, with 
your boyfriend, girlfriend, your fiance, or your spouse. And we want you to have a good time doing this. Talk to other couples about, hey, what are you gonna do for your date? Get some ideas, go out and enjoy each other, okay? So we're really excited about this. Glad you're with us today here at City Life. Let's get to the message. Love y'all. Everybody, how you doing? Good. Are you guys excited about that? Good. Way better than the first service. You guys are awake. That's good. So welcome to Valentine's Day. And in the words of Ron Swanson, it's a made-up holiday so Hallmark can sell cards to it. Agreed? Good. All right. So uh, we're excited about today. A couple things we're going to do is we, we pop this uh, screen up every single week, and we are praying for unity in our city. And I'll talk about that here in a second. But one of the things we want you to do is pay close attention to those Easter dates uh, be, that you heard Pastor Doug talk about, because that is something that we do every year. This 40-day fast is starting soon. We want you guys to take that very seriously. And uh, it's obviously not, we're call, not calling you to a 40-day food fast, but we are calling you to fast from some something that is, um, would be considered a vice in your life, something you always go to, something that you're, you find yourself whenever you're bored or, or anything, you have some downtime, you're going to that thing. For a lot of us, it's going to be screens. It's going to be our phones. It's going to be some game we're playing, binging on our TV or our iPad or whatever it is. And so we want you to be thinking about that now. Take this gradually. We don't want you to kill anyone during this 40 days. So be smart about this, okay? Um, but what we're going to ask you to do is when you when you're fasting from that thing, every time you go to like pick up the phone or do that thing, we want you to pray and ask God to, to be, to bless the Easter service that's going to happen because it is statistically the single most um, invited to event and people that you invite actually will say yes 80% of the time. And so that's why it's a really big deal because it's a one chance a year that people can really focus on hearing the gospel and what Jesus has done in salvation. Okay. So we want you to take that serious and join in those efforts with us. We're talking talking today specifically about a contractual or a covenantal love and what the difference between those two things are because it's a very very r revealing way on how we view our relationships especially in the confines of marriage okay so with this screen up here i want you to look at these churches in these pastors i want you to Re memorize these. I want you to pray for them throughout the week because what is happening here is something that is groundbreaking. This has never happened in our city before. And so what has happened is that Christ Together is an organization that comes in and they identify a point person in the city to use their relational capital to get pastors around the table and to try to unify them in our city efforts. And so uh, I get privileged to be that point person for Christ Together. And I ask these guys to come to the table. I asked a whole lot more of them to come, but these are the guys God wants at the table right now. And so the way that this works, there's something called an innovation curve. And so let me tell you why it's really important that these guys are up here first. There's the innovator on the front end of that, which God has allowed me to be for this. And then there's the early adopters. So if you can imagine this curve that goes like this, we have the innovator and the early adopters. These guys are the early adopters. These guys are the ones that are going to do a ton of the work to move this forward in the city. And then there's the early majority. The early majority climbs up the hill, and then there becomes a tipping point where the major majority then drives this the rest of the way. What I want you to know about this is we're in the very beginning stages of this. This, and God has put these men around the table to start to drive this forward. And it is going so much faster than we ever thought possible. The reason is because the Holy Spirit is the one that's guiding and directing this, not us. And so he is paving the way. He is allowing us to take ground for unity in this city because there's this weird thing about churches where they seem to compete with each other. Pastors aren't really for each other. They seem to be against each other. And these guys agree something needs to change about that. And so the reason we pray for them by name every week and we want you to do the same is because it's going to take all of us praying with this effort of unity to see this driven forward in this city, okay? And so let's go to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to mention each one of these guys by name and pray for them, and then we're going to jump into the service. So God, we just want to come before you and thank you for what you're doing here at City Life. God, I am so privileged to just to be able to be a part of this, and I know our church is excited about being a part of this too. And so this morning, as all of these pastors are preaching in their churches, I just want to specifically lift up Pastor Danny at Emmanuel and Pastor Matt at Greenwood Christian, Pastor Brock at Redeemer, and Pastor Ken at New Heights, and all of us here at City Life. God, we are preaching as a unified voice this morning because we're pointing everybody towards you. 
And God, we are so thankful that we get to be on the front end of this and that we get to watch you um, pull more and more churches and people together for the sake of unity. So God, I pray for boldness for all of us as pastors to step through the doors you open for us. And I pray for protection because the enemy does not want unity to happen. And so God, we pray that we can just celebrate and tell stories of unity in the future that can only point back to you. God, we pray for this morning. Let our hearts just resonate with these scriptures that we're going to look at out of Ephesians and 2 Corinthians in the context of relationship. God, I pray that you would do whatever work you need to do in our hearts, encourage us, convict us, whatever it is that needs to happen. But I pray that we would leave here changed. So we love you, and we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just move in the service right now. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to be in, some, in Ephesians here in just a little bit. You guys can start to flip there in your Bibles if you have it. If not, it'll be up on the screens for you. But I was thinking about this whole deal of relationships, and I remember as a boy growing up, I honestly don't think I ever thought about marriage as a boy. Anybody? Like, I don't really ever think about that. Trying to remember back, I was just in, interested in playing with toys and my friends. And, and, but it's weird when you watch the relationship dynamic, how it works throughout the years. Because in, in elementary school, I remember this vividly, it was this note passing thing with this yes and no check mark. Anybody remember that? But that was just to like go play on the playground. There was nothing else than that, right? Check yes or no if you want to play with me on the playground after this, right? And that was a big deal. And then you fast forward into middle school, and there's these weird three years that no one remembers. There's zits, and there's weird stuff happening to your body. So we just skip that, and then we move right to high school because nobody really understands what happens in middle school. <laughs> in high school, like fast forward to this, like all of a sudden, now I'm, I have to think like an adult, right? I might have to think about other people's feelings and emotions and this is weird I'm not trained for this and like how do I how do I impress this girl and I just need to look cool and I just want to be around my friends and like everything fast forwards then you get into this college phase if you go there and then all of a sudden you're, you're allowed to like experiment and trial and do all this stuff and then you're supposed to get married And you take all of these baggage, all of this baggage that you have from two very different backgrounds, you stick them together and you're like, good luck. (laughs) Have a great marriage. Happy happy life. (laughs) And it's like, it's nearly impossible, isn't it? Because the way that my wife and I grew up were so different. And actually today, we celebrate 24 years of marriage today. Isn't that cool? My wife loved it so much, she went to Florida without me. Uh, so, um, but no, she's there with my mom and sister. Uh, my parents would celebrate 49 years Friday. Um, and for those of you that don't know, I, I lost my dad unexpectedly in December. I'm not going to cry. I'm getting through this. And uh, we wanted her to not be here um, because it was, she loves the ocean and it's important for her to not be here during that reminder. And so she's having a blast. And my wife said she would make the sacrifice to go with her. And so um, <laughs> she's there and they're having a blast. So, um, but 24 years of marriage, man, it has been really difficult. And I'm going to kind of share some things from my own marriage with you guys. And um, I asked Amanda, I said, hey, did you ever think about marriage when you were a kid? And she's like, yeah, all the time. And I was like, why? And she's like, I don't know. It's just what girls do, I guess. And I don't know. Girls, is that true? Okay. So I just want to thank Disney for ruining that for men. Because we're supposed to be this prince that rides in on a horse. Nobody does that anymore. And you're supposed to rescue this lady. Now, my wife did get that. But most ladies, you don't have that. But... I just would like to thank Disney for ruining that for us. And so when you put these two things together, boys never think about marriage. Girls do think about marriage. And then you put these two things together, and you're supposed to thrive in a relationship that is a covenant like God has with you. That's a really, really big thing to do. And I want to actually see your hand raised on this one. How many of you were fully prepared for marriage? I got a half raise over there. I think it was because his wife made him. So no one, this is, this is my point, right? So we're supposed to enter into these lifelong covenantal relationships with virtually no training, right? No expectation of what it's going to be like. Now, my parents married 48 years. My wife's parents married 48 years. We saw longevity in marriage. We see it. But that still didn't prepare us for a covenant relationship of what the Lord expects. Now, I want you to think about your kids today. Anybody sitting in this room that's elementary, middle school, high school, college age, when I 
was learning about girls, I learned from like my friends, if my dad would talk to me about it, my grandpa, like I didn't have the internet. That wasn't even a thing. If, if it was, it was dial up and you threw your computer before the page ever popped up. Okay. And so I didn't learn about any of this stuff, but now we get to learn about whatever we want, but our minds are being shaped for relationships completely differently now, right? Because we have everything in our fingertips. And so what has happened is we're left up to our own devices to decide what a good relationship should look like today when I didn't have that option. I just view people's marriage. I enter in and I go, well, this is what I want. You tell me this is what you want. So I don't know, let's make this work. So to fast forward, I want you to think about your relationship. So whether you're dating in here, whether you're single and you want to be in a relationship, you're engaged or you're married, I want you to think about the context of your relationship, okay? Now, one of the things I say frequently, you know, there are two types of people sitting in this room. Those of you that have surrendered your life to Jesus and those of you that have not. That's the only distinction we make here at City Life, okay? And I, this is going to be very, very important for you to understand covenant relationship. Because those of you that are followers of Jesus, Jesus entered a covenant with you in salvation. So you understand covenant language. Those of you that do not have a relationship with Jesus, what I want you to do is I want you to listen to the difference between a covenant and a contract and understand that you can participate in that too with salvation with Jesus, okay? So let's jump in. We live in a contract world, so a lot of times we view our relationships the exact same way. But let's look at the difference between these two understandings of relationship. A contract is for a certain amount of time. So when we signed the lease for this building, it was for a very certain amount of time. We have options to extend. If we cut it short, there's penalty, so on and so on, okay? So a contract is for a very specific amount of time. The second point is both sides have to hold up their agreement. So I have to pay the rent. We have to pay the rent as a church or we no longer have a building, right? There's agreement that has to be upheld on both sides. They deal with specific actions. Now, in the context of relationship, it's something like, well, you have to love me because we're married, right? This is what a contract would look like. We would say things like that. But contracts are actually based on if and then mentality. If you treat me the way I want to be treated, then I will treat you that way back. But if you don't, then I will not, right? That's contractual language. We move on to the next one that says they're typically motivated by the desire to get something, right? Typically motivated by the desire to get something. So I want you to think about your relationships. What are you motivated by in them? Is it to get something or to give something? And the last one is, if things are not lived up to, the contract can be dissolved. Yeah, we gave it a good run. Let's just get rid of it and let's move on, okay? Now, I want you to listen to the difference in a covenant relationship. This is something completely different. From the first point, a covenant is initiated for the benefit of the other person. Wow, that's wildly different than a contract. A covenant is initiated for the benefit of the other person. A man, imagine standing on an altar to get married, knowing fully in your heart and mind you're initiating this for the sake of this other person, not you. I mean, that changes things a lot, doesn't it? A covenant relationship allows for unconditional promises. There are no conditions. Now, covenant relationship is also based on steadfast love, which pulls these two things together. Steadfast love is an intentional choice. Steadfast love does not waver when this person is not upholding their side of the bargain, if you will. It's very, very intentional from both sides. A covenant is permanent. There's no end date on a covenant. And a covenant relationship requires loving confrontation and forgiveness. Now, before you only heard the word confrontation, listen to this again. It requires loving confrontation and forgiveness. What does that mean? Well, okay, so you say I'm supposed to be gracious and merciful, so that means if they're doing something, I should just let them do it and pray for them, right? Wrong. That does not mean you actually care for, remember, the benefit of the other person. What that means is you care for you because you don't want to have that awkward conversation. We don't want to call each other out because, honestly, most of the time, we don't really know how to call people out lovingly. 
We just either drop the hammer or put these subtle hints out there like passive aggressive cold shouldering. And so we don't really know how to like lovingly confront so we can then move and work through things and forgive. But it is vastly different, a covenant and a contract. Every biblical relationship, not just marriage, is supposed to be a covenantal relationship. I want you to process that for a second. And I want you to think about the difference in these two things. Like, and I want you to specifically pull your marriage into this if you're married here today. And I want you to weigh everything that is said through Scripture based on your marriage. Based on a marriage you had, based on a marriage you want, and based on relationships that you're involved in right now. Now, let me ask you this. I remember standing on an altar, nervous as could be, back when I was 22 years old, marrying my wife. Don't try to do the math, okay? I'm still in my 20s. (laughs) And I remember standing in front of all of these people saying things to her that I legitimately could not tell you one thing I said to her. Not one. I was so nervous and like, this guy's telling me to repeat stuff after him, and I'm only focusing on not messing that part up. I don't even know what that guy said. I could have like, I don't know. I could have sworn something completely weird and different there, and I would have never known. And I'm sure it was the same for her. And then we send people off in marriage, and we go, remember these covenants, because this is what binds you together, right? And nowadays, I stand in front of a lot of people, and I perform their ceremonies, and they write their vows, and they're beautiful, and they're crying, and everybody is happy, and it's amazing. And two weeks later, they don't even remember what they said either. (laughs) And then we have to tell you to recall those covenant things that you said to each other in the darkest and worst times of your marriage. Now, let's go to Ephesians 4, because this is applicable to all relationships, but especially to our marriage relationships. Ephesians 4, verse 29. We're going to have a fun exercise after this one. Verse 29 says, No foul language should come from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need and so that it gives grace to those who hear. Now, I want you guys to do a fun exercise after church, okay? I want you to go to Kroger or Meyer or Walmart, wherever it is you shop, and I want you to buy a pound of lunch meat. Okay? And I want you to take it home and I want you to microwave it until it's disgusting. All right? Then I want you to set it aside somewhere, not in a cooler, out of your house, away a little bit, where it's just rotten, foul meat. And the next time you get in an argument, I want you to go grab a hunk of it and throw it in the face of your spouse. <laughs> Any takers? Please don't raise your hand. I knew it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let no corrupt communication or foul language come out of your mouth, the literal translation to that is rotten meat. Like, I don't care how angry I was at my wife, I would never throw rotten meat in her face. I would hope she would not do the same to me. But legitimately, this is the picture that they're painting. That's disgusting. But what happens is, look at the alternative. So that's contractual language. Look at the alternative. But only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. I want you to picture your marriage with only those words involved. All of my speech is only to build my wife up. That it's gracious to help her in times of need. No other language. Normal, average, everyday conversation and that language. That is a really big difference. That is, sounds impossible to me, I'll be honest with you. Now, I don't want to throw rotten meat in my wife's face, but that's really hard to talk like that all of the time. But look at verse 30. Verse 30 says, And don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. Now, let me pause for a second. I want to make sure you catch this. This is really important. Does that mean... If I am communicating with this foul, rotten meat that I'm grieving the Holy Spirit, yes, it does. And he says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit because he actually sealed you. Now, this means in all of our relationships, church. This isn't specific to marriage. It means in all of them. So, have you ever heard, like, those words that they give life or they give death? Like, this is very, very true and real. And it actually grieves the Holy Spirit. Now look at verse 31. 
It says, let all bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting and slander be removed from you along with all malice. Now, what this is doing is this is showing a before and after in this, okay? So there's an assumption that these things are going to come into relationships with you, okay? So it says, let all of this stuff be removed from you. So there is evidence in some of these things present in all of us, all right? Now, here's what we do in relationships. I was hurt in relationships before I married my wife. She was hurt in relationships before she married me. Now, there's easily can be these things brought in our marriage because I'm expecting her to do the same thing to me that some of these other girls did in the past to hurt me. She's expecting me to do the same thing to her that some of these other guys have hurt her in the past and therefore some bitterness and some anger and some wrath and some shouting and some slander along with malice, is going to be introduced into our relationship if we don't remove it. And so as we look at contract versus covenant, I can have all this language in a contract because it doesn't really matter. But in the covenant, there's no place for this kind of language. And so as somebody does something to me, as my wife does something to me, I will know how I react to her immediately if I'm looking at her through contractual eyes or through the eyes of Jesus. If I get angry, if I use wrath, if I shout at her, I start to slander her to her face behind her back to other people, and I start to have malice or malcontent towards her, I'm viewing her completely through contractual eyes, not eyes of love. Now, um, this, there's a pastor in, in um, Jacksonville, Florida named Joby Martin, and he kind of gives a description of this that I think is, is hilarious and it's awesome. And I'm going to stereotype just a little bit here but that men are the shouters and women are the silent treatmenters. And I know that there's some flip-flop there, but we're just going to go with that for right now, okay? And I want you to think about throughout the course of your marriage, you men are the shouters in the relationship, okay? You want to get your point across that way. It's not worked up till this point, but you think doing it one more time, she's going to get it, okay? And so you're close enough to her as you're making your point, and their breath is, she can feel your breath on her face. I want you to think about maybe this is what she's thinking on the other side. Year after year, you yell to get your point across. Your wife is sitting there saying, wow, I've never seen that viewpoint before. Thank you. All this yelling me is showing me I need to change. Has that worked for anyone in here? <laughs> the other side, ladies, typically, you give the angry eyebrow silent treatment, <laughs> right? So I want you to think about on the other side, I am thinking to myself, if this is what my wife gives me, you know, as I'm sitting here in this awkward silence, she's really showing me what I did was wrong. I can feel change happening inside. Thank you, honey. <laughs> Like, this doesn't work. But yet we continue to operate in these kind of relationship styles because we learned this somehow, right? Now, I will say in our relationship, my wife's the angry eyebrow silent treatmenter, and I'm the yeller, okay? So this is true of our relationship. I can tell you I've never, ever, ever walked away from an argument with my wife feeling like she's changed based on my yelling ability, <laughs> she is confident I've never walked away from the silent treatment closer to Jesus. <laughs> In fact, it infuriates me way more, and she knows that. <laughs> and so here's how this goes in our house, okay? If we're in a disagreement, and I feel like my normal voice is not enough for her, and I need to elevate it so she makes sure and hears what I'm saying, my wife is a lengthy processor. So for her, I know she needs time away to process. And so well, how this works is the, the more that I get vocal, the more that she is silent, and the more distance is put in between us. And so I'm like, hey, listen, I know you need time to process. Go. You good? You good now? <laughs> because I'm like, what is there to process? I processed this already. I'm ready to talk about it. She's like, I'm not ready to talk about it. And we know these things about each other, but yet we still fall victim to this sometimes. Now, let me tell you something that we introduced into our marriage a long, long time ago that was a game changer. The first few years of my marriage were horrible. Just being straight up honest with you. My wife and I get married young. Neither one of us had a good picture of what marriage should look like. 
Neither one of us were pre prepared, prepared for what we were entering into. So it caused a lot of conflicts in our marriage early on. Now, we even had the conversation of like, man, did we make a mistake here? Like, this isn't supposed to go like this. I don't like this. You don't like this. Like, are we going to continue with this? What I can tell you is, if we would have had a contractual relationship, we would not be married today. But because of our covenantal relationship with Jesus first and each other second, we are celebrating 24 years of marriage today. Has not been easy all the time. And we have had to learn and grow and, and have setbacks and have forward moving things. All of these happening. Literally, like, we are still having conversations of, of being in relationship with each other 25 years where we're still growing in things. And that is the key to us never, ever becoming complacent in our relationship with Jesus or each other. And so one of the things that we instituted early on, and literally, I did not want to do this. I suggested it as the spiritual leader of the home. I said, hey, when we come into an argument, we have to immediately pray together. And there would be times, I kid you not, where I'm like, hey, God, it's me again. <laughs> I'm here with Amanda, and we're arguing. <laughs> And she would pray like, yeah, God, I'm here too. <laughs> and as you pray through these like gritted teeth, what tends to happen is the Holy Spirit starts to minister to you. And within words, seconds, like it's starting to lift and it's starting, you're starting to be driven back together again because of the covenant relationship. And then at the end of it, no matter if that prayer is 20 seconds or 20 minutes, there's like this resolve that happens because you're coming to the Lord in covenant. You're not holding each other to a contract. It is so difficult as you're fighting to go pray in the bedroom together. I promise you, if you can take the walk down the hall, get around the bed, do whatever it is, I promise you it will work. Because you are going to the Lord with your marriage. And man, it just subsides. <laughs> Like afterwards, you talk and you're like, I don't even know how it got to that place. It was stupid. And like, why did we do that? And, and I'm telling you guys, like these ways that we treat each other to try to get something on our own, it just doesn't work. So look at verse 32. Verse 32 says, actually, yeah, verse 32 says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. These are some heavy hitters, aren't they? Be kind and compassionate to your wife, Mike, forgiving her just as God also forgave you in Christ. Amanda, be kind and compassionate to Mike, forgiving him. That's what the verse says, okay? <laughs> forgiving him as God forgave you in Christ. That's a lot to live up to, isn't it? So as I'm supposed to be kind and compassionate to her, remember the first line of a covenant. It's initiated completely for the benefit of my wife. And me being kind and compassionate, forgiving her as God forgave me, is the literal definition of that. I mean, think about this, church. This is why we're talking about covenant relationship, okay? For those of you that are followers of Jesus, here's what I need you to understand about this. God had no reason to forgive you of your sin. And if you understand that, you'll agree with me and say, yeah, amen, okay? Y'all need help. Make sure you heard this one more time. God had no reason to forgive us. If you understand that, you'll agree with me by saying amen. amen. Much better. Now, with that being said, as we move on in relationships, I have no business not forgiving my wife when God had no business forgiving me, but did anyways. How can I do that? How can she not forgive me when she was forgiven first? That's what a covenant is. And how it starts this initiation by God saying, I'm going to send Jesus to be the final price for salvation. He's going to offer a covenant to people. One that's not dependent on them. And as they surrender their life to me, I will uphold my side of the covenant, whether they do or not. And I want you to imitate that. This is a game changer for our marriage. This is a game changer for your marriage. 
Because what it is, is we, we, if we can imagine this is a mirror, we step out from in front of the mirror and we look at our spouse and go, this marriage is for you. Because in a contract, we stand in front of the mirror and say, okay, I'm not getting what I need here. I'm not getting what I deserve. I need to make sure and do these things so I can get served and pleased and I can have my needs met. So look at verse, or chapter 5, verse 1. It says, therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. We hate the word sacrifice. Covenant wouldn't have happened if Jesus didn't sacrifice his life. Think this through. Let's say that you are 100% right in the argument you're in. 100% right. Jesus, as he's literally being condemned to death, is 100% innocent, never speaks up, never clears his name, goes to the cross and dies guilty, even though he was innocent, never spoke a word to defend his position. That's imitating Christ. It doesn't matter if I am completely right. She is completely wrong. In order for me to imitate Christ, I am here for the benefit of her. Now, let me remind you of something from this covenant. A covenant relationship requires loving confrontation and forgiveness. That's coming, but I don't have to do it right then to prove my point. I can actually imitate Christ because after he died... And after he went into a tomb, and after he resurrected and proved he was Jesus, then the truth came out. Oh, he was God. Okay. Wow. Everything he said just came true. But he didn't have to, like, defend his position in the moment and say, I've never done anything wrong. He died guilty. Him resurrecting back to life was all the evidence that was needed. So when we're in these moments of heat and frustration and anger, we do not have to prove ourselves right in the moment. It's not about me being right. It is about me walking in imitation of Christ. And then when things settle down and things are less heated, I can have a loving, confrontational, and forgiving moment. Game changer. Now, this is really hard for us. Let me tell you why this is so hard. We're going to pop a verse up on the screen, a couple of verses here. I want you to read these and understand these. Then we're going to close. In 2 Corinthians 10, this is Paul talking about our life in Christ, okay? In verse 3, it says, for although we live in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh. If you could just get that verse from today, and if you're a follower of Jesus, you will leave here majorly ahead in your marriage, okay? Because I, as a husband of 24 years, know exactly what to say to make my wife feel insecure. She is a wife of 24 years, knows exactly what button to push to make me boil. But whenever she says something like that, if I understand that I'm not fighting against her, how could I hold that against her? My war, your war, is not in our spouses. It is the enemy who is swirling things around us, trying to get us divided, right? And if you can just understand this verse today, you're going to be miles and miles ahead. Look at what the rest of it says. Look at verse 4. Since the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds. Okay, let's talk through this for a second. If I realize I am not fighting against her in the flesh, why would I use a fleshly weapon? Why would I then yell and try to put her down in her place? Why would she then silent treat, cold shoulder me and try to get me to respond? Those are fleshly weapons, right? Now, the strongholds, if you remember back from Ephesians, it says, remember all those things that we bring into the relationship? If I bring something into my relationship and I'm assuming she's going to do the same thing, I've allowed that to be a stronghold in my life. That's not her problem. That's my problem. She's just the one that feels the weight of that. 
It's not my problem she brings us into her, our relationship. It's her problem. I'm the one who feels the weight of that. And the only way to destroy that is for, number one, me to understand that this is an enemy that's trying to divide something that Jesus has put together, but that my weapons of warfare are what we do. We go to the Lord and seek him, and we fight that way. Look at the next verse in verse 5. Verse 5 says, a continuation of 4, um, we demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Okay, now, let's say that I had somebody cheat on me in the past. When my wife doesn't answer a phone call or a text fast enough, or she tells me she's going to be home at a certain time and she's not, and my mind goes, uh-oh, it's happening again, then I have to, according to Scripture, grab that thought and go, wait a minute, let me measure this up against Scripture. Has she ever done this? No? Okay. Um, do you have any reason to believe this is true about her now? No? Is she a daughter of God? Yes. This is your stronghold you need to destroy, and this thought is gone. Every time that she would dress herself up and look pretty for me and step out in front of me, maybe looking for a, a comment or something, and I just look at her and I just walk away. Her insecurity all of a sudden flares up and she's like, he doesn't even find me pretty or attractive anymore, and he's probably with another woman. She has to grab that and she has to go, wait a minute, has he ever done that to me before? Is any of this true about him? Is he a son of God? Then this thought is captured and it is thrown out. If you have to do this 1,000 times a day to destroy these strongholds, you need to do this 1,000 times a day until those strongholds are destroyed. Because look at verse 7. Look at what is obvious. If anyone is confident that he or she belongs to Christ, let me pause this verse really quick. Answer this in your head. Are you confident you are a follower of Jesus by surrendering your life to him. Answer yes or no in your head right now. If you answered yes, let him remind himself of this. This is coming back to gospel centrality. You know what you're reminding yourself of? You're reminding yourself of God didn't have to forgive me, but he did. He set me free. He wiped the slate clean. I am made new. That's what I remind myself of. Church, you need to remind yourself of that all the time. I have to remind myself of this all the time because the enemy wants me to forget that. When he lets me forget that, I start to fight with weapons of the flesh. I start to see my wife as somebody that I'm in a contract with. And you will start to view your relationships this way too if you don't have this covenant relationship with God. So I told you in the beginning there's two groups of people sitting in this room, those of you that have surrendered your life to Christ and those of you that have not yet. Covenant means something different to both groups of people. For those of you that have not surrendered your life to Christ, you don't have a covenant with God. The Bible is just really clear about that. Let me explain what that means. It means that because of our sin, we're eternally separated from God because somebody had to pay that penalty. No matter how many lifetimes we could live, no matter how good we could possibly be, we could never, ever pay that debt. So God said, okay, Jesus, I need you to go pay this debt of sin. You're perfect. I need you to go be the perfect sacrifice, the final sacrifice on earth. Jesus agrees. He comes to earth. He pops up on the scene in the flesh about 30 years old. He's kind of been under the radar until then. And he starts his public ministry. And he starts to heal people and he starts to cast demons out. And he's proclaiming that he is God in the flesh. Now, let me pause for a second. You don't have to believe me on this. Although we fully believe what the Bible says, there are plenty of historical and scientific documents that prove Jesus' existence. So if you're a skeptic like I was, I love that. And we have lots of other stuff that we can show you. But what I need you to hear and understand is Jesus really did come and he really did die. And more importantly, he rose again to make salvation possible. That is something we could never accomplish. And that is why Jesus says, I have taken the first step in this covenant. 
Remember, a covenant is for the benefit of the other person. It didn't benefit Jesus to come here and be falsely accused and murdered, to die and come back to life. It benefited us. And so what I want you to realize about this covenant is when you surrender your life to that, The rest of your life is then lived for him in that covenant. Why? Because he initiated it first, not us. And if you're here in this room today and you do not have a relationship with Jesus, I don't know what your thought is about a relationship with Jesus, but if it wasn't what I just explained to you, then it was off, okay? And I want you to understand that everything that you've ever done in your life, that you would die if people knew, Jesus knows and he'll forgive you anyways. For those of you that have been forgiven, can we say amen to that? What I want you to hear and understand is you can enter a covenant relationship with Jesus today. We want to have a conversation with you after this service is over. We want to explain what this means. We want to be able to show you what it means in our own lives. Because I am living proof that Jesus exists. For those of you that have a relationship with Jesus, you're already in a covenant with him. I want you to do something very specifically for me today. If you've realized your marriage has been operating like a contract and you're a follower of Jesus, I'm going to ask you to do two things before you leave today. Number one, I'm going to ask you to ask God to forgive you. Like when we pray here in a minute, I'm going to ask you to say, God, I have acted in contracts, not covenant. That's not fair to you because you've never put me in a contract please forgive me. And if you're with your spouse, I need you to turn to them and I need you to ask them to forgive you. And if they're not here with you, I need you to call them before you leave this building and say, I know this won't make sense to you. We'll watch this together later, but please forgive me. I have not treated you like a covenant relationship and I want to. And you may say, why do I have to do it when I'm in this building? Because the enemy knows while you're here, you're much more likely to do this. You go out those doors and you're going to forget, I promise. It's not going to be as important to you. It's not going to be a hot burner issue right now because you're thinking about this right now. I am going to call my wife later and apologize to her. There's things in our marriage we have allowed to become contracts not covenant, both of us. And I'm going to have her watch this later. We're going to talk about it. And I'm going to apologize to God first. And then I'm going to apologize to her. None of us are outside of this. And what I'm asking you to do is to take this serious because we are. And more importantly, God does. This is about grace and forgiveness and mercy, church. This isn't about you looking at that other person and apologizing and then saying things like, well, you are pretty hard to love. <laughs> Let's leave that out. So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you to just be really honest right now. Look, if you're sitting here with your spouse, you don't have to pretend they know if it's contract or covenant or not. If they're not, you can maybe pretend a little, but you really know inside. So I guess my question is, what's it going to be? Because see, the covenant relationship that Jesus starts with us in salvation that we surrender to, he calls us to actually be a light in the world. Now, you take two people in a marriage covenant who are in covenant relationship with Jesus, and that's twice the light, or at least it's supposed to be. And so what should happen is, because you two love each other like Jesus loved you, you should literally be lights in this world everywhere you go to the point that you expect people to come and say, what is different about your life and your marriage? You should expect it. So... If that's not the description of your marriage, then we've got some work to do, right? Let's spend some time right now. If you're not a follower of Jesus, you can head to the back. You can head over to the couches. You can wait for me to come down and grab me. But we have people ready to have this conversation with you, ready to tell you what that means to surrender your life to Jesus. Please don't leave without talking with us. If you're a follower of Jesus in this room and you're in a relationship that would be more contractual, even a friend relationship, this doesn't have to be marriage. 
I'm going to ask you to take this really serious and do some business right now. Ask God to forgive you for that. He promises he will. But then you have to ask the spouse. You have to ask the boyfriend. You have to ask the girlfriend. You have to ask the fiance. And then let's work together to move forward in covenant relationship. God, we love you. We pray that you got the glory here today. Help us to move forward as lights in this world together. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you guys stand and worship with us? Thank you.